back to the ultraviolet tide. I'm excited for today's conversation because we are talking about all things pop culture and beauty standards. And I have a fantastic guest here today to walk us through all of it. Adrian, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. We were kind of debriefing before we started recording just about our excitement of talking about this topic because it's going to be a fun one. We love pop culture. We love all things Beyonce, Taylor Swift, everything in between. So I think this is going to be a great conversation. Me too. All right. So before we officially dive in and start geeking out about all this stuff, I am going to introduce you um, so that our audience can get to know you a little bit better. So Dr. Adrian Trierbenik is a gender and media scholar and the author of The Beyonce Effect and Gender and Pop Culture. Her insights have been shared in noted publications like The New York Times, Glamour, NPR, and a ton more. That's just a few of them. Um, Adrian began her graduate work in sociology at Virginia Tech in 2005. Go Hokies. I'm a Hokie. <laughs> um, and in 2011, she received a PhD in sociology from West Michigan University. Now, Adrian, I know that is just the tip of the iceberg um, when it comes to your qualification. So give us a little bit more detail into you and the work that you do. So first of all, I'm excited that you're a Hokie. Yes, That's so exciting. go Hokies. I, I just had to explain the other day that it's not a chicken. So this is, this oh is my really God. exciting. Not a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, okay, so you, you kind of summed me up very perfectly with that introduction. Um, I look at the connection between gender and media. So how people in media are um, either representing gender or choose to represent gender. So for example, Barbie that just came out is a really good example of choosing to represent gender. Um, and, you know, if you want to look at things like comedians or other things like that, how they choose to interpret gender. I also tend to kind of move toward um, how people use pop culture to help them heal after they've experienced trauma. So I've done quite a bit on uh, things like uh, if someone has been sexually assaulted or in a domestic violence relationship or has had any sort of trauma um, that has affected them, that they then use some sort of media to help pull them out of it or to give them support or to find support in there. So things like looking at, I looked at um, fans of Tori Amos. Um, I've looked at fans of Beyonce. Um, I'm working on a book on fans of Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift is kind of one of the perfect, perfect examples of that, of how people use those lyrics to help them in some way. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm thinking of every single high schooler going through their first breakup listening to Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. Or their parents get a divorce or, you know, something yep. else happens that affects them. Yep. Yeah, it's such an interesting way to look at the world around you. And, you know, specifically from our angle and what Low Ultraviolet does is we look a lot at beauty standards and tanning culture and everything like that. So what I want to really do a deep dive into is the cultural implications and how they affect beauty standards. So, you know, we've all been guilty of that comparison game and social media, you know, looking at things and comparing our life and basing maybe how they look or how they act or their vacations based off of what we do. Um, so just to start things on a broader sense, and then we'll get a little bit more granular about how does culture impact beauty standards? And I know that is such a broad question. So if we need to break it down further, we can do that as well. No, it's great because um, it really is determined by what culture you're in, right? So American culture of what we think of as beauty is totally different than other places around the world. Um, but since we're, we're here in America, we'll talk about American <laughs> based um, beauty culture. And I think one of the things maybe you were that I think might apply to what you all do is if you think about social media and then you think about the way that apps within or um, filters within social media have sort of taken over, right? So 10 years ago, Instagram was a place that, yes, you could post maybe even more than that was a post where you just like take pictures of things and post them. And then this with the advent of apps that, that have filters or ways that mm -hmm. you can uh, kind of what we're doing right now, right? Where you can video yourself in one scenario and then upload it to Instagram and you can kind of adjust the image or adjust what someone says. 
with that sort of taking over, we've seen a shift in the way that we approach beauty and culture. Um, filters have been a really interesting example of cultural beauty standards because they can make you look like anything, right? Like I have nieces yep. and nephews and one of the ways we pass time in like busy restaurants or like when the food hasn't come yet is I pull up a filter on my phone that does things like looks like your face is yeah. on fire or paints your face a certain You're way right. or mm -hmm. they always want like they always want the ones that are the weirdest like the most bizarre things <laughs> that's what they want and and in that sense it's great but at the same time you know um the the advent of filters has meant that nobody kind of looks like what they really look like when you yep. post yourself and you can make yourself look however you want. And when we're talking specifically about skin, I mean, you can make your skin do anything you want it to do in those situations. Yeah. You can add things, you some, can subtract things. And that's changed the way I think we all kind of see beauty, especially for yeah. younger generations who maybe haven't existed in that bubble yet, Out, or sorry, outside of that bubble yet. Yeah, I think that's such a good point about, you know, those unrealistic beauty standards when it does come to um, you know, filters and everything. It's so interesting because you have a whole generation that's growing up right now with social media being a part of basically their everyday lives. And that was not the norm when I was growing up. Instagram wasn't a thing until I was in high school. So it wasn't like people didn't even have phones when I was mm -hmm. growing up until later in life. I mean, I got my first phone. I think I was a sophomore in high school. Oh gosh, I'm dating myself now, but it was not a thing. And now you just have all of these tools to foster comparison and these feelings of maybe inadequacy that didn't exist before. So this is very much a new phenomenon. Yeah, there's a, a um, it's a kind of a term that you find in criminal justice, but it's a panopticon. Basically, we're always being surveyed. And in criminal justice, it refers to like in prison systems where they have the tower you can always see what people are doing. But that's kind of where we're at now, where people constantly have their phones out and they constantly are videoing or photographing or whatever. And you you cannot escape the notion that you're always being looked at. And that does something mm -hmm. to somebody's mental health also. When you're constantly wondering, um, oh, am I in the background of that? How did I look? Or when you know you walk into a space and people are videoing something, and you're in it. How do I? How do I look? It it does something to be under that constant surveillance to your mental state. Yeah, I think so too. I was listening to a podcast episode yesterday, actually, that was talking about. Um, they were basically just going over what they did over the holidays, and one girl was saying that um, she deleted Instagram, all social media, two years ago, and she was with her family over the holidays, and they had a day where it was just rainy, it was gross out, and they were all sitting on their phones. So for a second, she took her mom's phone to look at what her friends were up to because people were like, oh, did you see like your best friends on this vacation? So she took her mom's phone to look at it and she said, 10 minutes on the app and my brain started doing things again that it hadn't done in two years. Yeah, it's so true. It does affect the way you think about stuff. Wow. It's just interesting. She said 10 minutes. I'm like, man, I, mm -hmm. I kind of believe it, especially when you haven't been exposed to it in a while. You start scrolling and before you know it, I mean, I've had to set boundaries on myself too when it comes to social media, like get off the app, go read a book, get away from it for a little bit, <laughs> um, allow your yep. brain to decompress. Um, yep. But okay, so that's kind of, you know, on a broader cultural level, but let's talk about on a pop culture level because that is a whole entity in and of itself of let's talk about celebrities and influencers and how they can basically set a standard for what's considered beautiful using their own platforms now. Um, and how does that impact beauty standards? It's so funny because I think a lot of people would like to think that it doesn't affect them, but what you just said mm -hmm. sort of demonstrates how much it does. Yeah. And, you know, um, I, I do this thing with my students where uh, I have them do an assignment that I call, who do you follow? And I have them in a Google doc, they put down what social media accounts they have, including like YouTube and um, kind of things that maybe aren't as noted for social media, although YouTube is kind of changing that. 
Uh, and then they have to write down how many people they follow, how many people follow them. And then mm -hmm. of the accounts they follow, how many of them are like, like activists or people trying to change the world or, you know, like something beyond like I'm posting this stuff and that's my job. Right. Mm -hmm. And every semester you get the outliers, the people who have said nope to social media completely. And the people who have yeah. just an insane amount of people they follow, but the majority of them, once they start to dig in, realize that the people they're following are people they look up to aesthetically as opposed to mm. like actions that they're doing. So they're finding people that I want to look like that body. I want to have that face. I want her hair. I want that the skincare regimen. That's what is attractive. And it's not mm. really until you sit down and look at who you're following that um, you, you make that, you make that connection between how is this affecting me? And, um, did I even realize I was doing it? It's very easy to click mm -hmm. that follow button and, yeah. and have, you know, this account now flooded into your account and the algorithm decide what you're going to like to see and, and all of that. There's kind of more of a conscious choice in trying to figure out who you follow. Yeah. It's super interesting too. Cause I feel like I've seen more of a trend of people, kind of auditing who they follow um, and you kind of, kind of removing people that might not add value to their life and stuff like that. But if you think about the rise of Instagram and like blogger culture, now this is kind of a tangent in and of itself. But when you think about that, their titles are legitimately lifestyle influencers. So they're trying to sell mm -hmm. you on like a certain lifestyle, skincare routine, vacations, all this stuff. And it's not really... Um, audited in any kind of way of what they're selling as like a healthy lifestyle or routine and all that stuff. You kind of just have to take their word for gold. And if you aren't um, actively consuming that content in terms of like, huh, maybe that's, there's a filter on that, or maybe there's, uh, they're only sharing a highlight reel and, and all of that stuff. If you're not actively thinking through those things before you know it, you have a very skewed perception of maybe their reality or even your own reality. Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought up lifestyle blogging because I think it's with like Pinterest and stuff. I think it's an interesting way to present a certain side of yourself too, just not necessarily the way you look, but how you want people to see you, right? Mm -hmm. So um, in my little world, uh, we call that impression management, but it basically like you can constantly curate the image you want people to see when you're talking about the internet. Um, I really liked that you asked me about celebrity culture because um, I think that there's an interesting mix, right? Like you have people following celebrity and just, you know, wanting to see beautiful people like doing beautiful things in beautiful spaces. Mm -hmm. And I kind of get that like escapism part. Right. And then you have celebrity culture where they're really trying to challenge what people think of as this utopian world of a celebrity society. So if you look at some like someone like Jamila Jamil, who um, created a podcast called I Way and a whole kind mm -hmm. of movement about body acceptance, right? There's a woman I really like. If anybody has ever seen the show Ghosts, the US version, I like the UK version too, but there's a US version of the show Ghosts. And there's a woman on there, Danielle Pinnock. I might be saying her name wrong. It might be Pinnock. I don't know. Um, but she plays mm -hmm. Alberta and she started an uh, Instagram page called Body Positivity and or Body Courage. Mm -hmm. And and she just goes about her life doing her thing in the body that she lives in. And that does should not seem as radical as it is, but it, it kind of is <laughs> radical right. to have people right. creating pages like that. Right. No, I completely agree. I think if pages like that exist, there's a reason that they were necessary and that they were created in the first place. And I don't know, it's super interesting because growing up now with being old enough to recognize what social media was doing, it's just been very interesting. And one thing I think about all the time is impact it specifically has on the low ultraviolet community when it comes to tanning culture and, you know, seeing bikini ads and summer ads and vacation and everything. I mean, they're just exposed to basically unhealthy imagery all the time that people are consuming as like maybe luxury or relaxation or all of all of the above. I am so glad you asked me this question. I have to be honest, I have never really thought 
that deeply about tanning because I, I live in Florida, so I'm constantly head to toe sunscreen. I'm the person who walks in the SPF hat, right? Like I am all of those things and it never (laughs) occurred to me to flip and be the other way. So this was a great question for me to mull over since um, you emailed me and I actually have a question for you too, but I'll, okay. I'll kind of dive in first. Um, so I think that there is a trifecta happening when we talk about tanning and tanning culture. I think it's the perfect combination of cultural appropriation, which means mm-hmm. that when you take from one culture and apply it to your own and kind of take ownership of it. So I think it's a trifecta of cultural appropriation, body image stuff. And I also think it's, it's connected to fat shaming. Because there's a lot of folks who believe that tan looks better than pale and it makes you look Mm -hmm. thinner. So therefore, if you can't lose weight, try tanning as a way to make yourself appear a certain way. I'm not saying that's right. I'm saying that's kind of the messaging that's happening. Yeah. No, Um, I, yeah. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just agreeing with what you're saying. And also like the fact that when you tan, um, it makes a lot of people feel better because of the hormones being released from the physical yes. act of the vitamin D and everything. Um, doesn't make it t- mean it's healthy, but it makes you feel good. So in your head, you're like, yes. I feel healthier. I have more energy. Yes. It's the same thing that happens with social media, right? Like you get the serotonin rush and your yep. brain is like, this feels good. I should be doing more of this. Right. Um, you know, versus like going out and running or something to get your serotonin up. Uh, yep. I think that's what's interesting about people who focus on being tan as like the objective or as like the, mm-hmm. the ideal way to be. Yeah. Um, it's interesting too, because there's a lot of research that, that connects the darker someone's skin is to like less opportunity in the world. And that doesn't seem to apply for tanning. So it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing to think about. It's also something, if, I, if I'm being totally honest, when I was in high school, tanning was what you did. I went to school in Northern Michigan, so we were pale, like yeah. just naturally pale people. <laughs> and yeah. so people went to tanning beds and got like the, the card and like, you know, you got the sixth one for free and you did all of that and yeah. did not even think twice about it until one day my boyfriend at the time looked at me and said, your skin doesn't look like your skin anymore. Like this is not the the face and the skin of somebody that, you know, I, I cared about or I care about. And, and I kind of thought that that stuff had fallen out since the nineties. And then I joined a gym over the summer. Cause again, I'm in Florida and you can't work out outside in the summertime and they have tanning beds inside the gym. And that blew my mind that that was something that is still happening. And so I, I'm kind of wondering what your interpretation of it is, because you would know more than me, like, is how much of a thing is this, is this still, is this still? Yeah, it's crazy. And that's a fantastic question, because it's kind of crazy how much it still is a thing, um, given how much information has slowly began to like trickle out about the harmful effects of it. I think it's very similar to what happened with smoking. And how long it took for everyone to recognize that smoking was hazardous to your health and start making decisions. Tanning is very similar to that. Um, I know we just shared uh, our Virginia Tech connection. Um, I know at my apartment complex, when I was an undergrad, they had tanning booths in the clubhouse. Um, and it was it was shown as an amenity for living there is that you could use these tanning beds for free. Oh, really? Yeah. And that, I mean. That's insane. That, that wasn't that long ago. Um, but it's even if tanning beds are starting to get a bad rep, people are still trying to wrap their head around the fact that like, you know, when you're out playing sports or if you're out at the pool all day in the summer, like that is just as hazardous for your health. Now it's not as compounded and it's not as strong as sitting in a tanning bed. Um, But what it does is creates damage over the long term. So all 
all skin damage is compounded over time, right? After you get a sunburn, mm -hmm. that, that DNA damage is done, which is so crazy. And it's hard to explain to people because when you start to say it like that, it gets a little preachy, right? You're like, well, that's scary. Well, mm -hmm. that, that doesn't sound like what I want to think about on my vacation. I want to relax. I want to feel good. I want the vitamin D. I want the hormone rush. So <laughs> it's really hard to explain it in a way that doesn't sound like your mom like nagging you. <laughs> it's really true. It's so funny. I, I think that you're very right about the serotonin that happens from from um, being exposed to immense amounts of rain of sun, especially if you live in a place where it's dark a lot, or you know, you have the seven months of darkness like I had when I was in Michigan. Um, yeah. it, there is the attachment to that. Um, it's also why kind of circling back to what I said at the beginning, it's it's why culture really depends on where you're at, right? Um, I live in a state now where uh, sunscreen is just, it's just like, you can get it at the front of the store when you walk in. Like it's, it's very common. People tend to put it in their cars and drive around with it. But we also are very aware of how much sun we have down here and yeah. what we need to do to protect ourselves. And in other regions, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in Scandinavia and I needed sunscreen there one day and I walked into their, their store and I, the, the biggest thing I could find was like this tiny travel size SPF 15 that was not, would have done nothing for me, but I bought it anyway, cause it was better than nothing. And, right. you know, because it's not important. They, they, they don't have the exposure we have. They have longer, uh, uh, they have shorter days and. It's, it's just a very different scenario. Yeah. No, it is super fascinating because then you also think about the cultural implications that you mentioned before of, you know, if you think back to the earlier days, like this is, let's talk back to like the 1800s and 1900s, having paler <laughs> skin was seen as like you weren't outside. So that was a symbol of luxury, yeah. like you weren't outside, you weren't working. And it's super interesting because um, I'm going to geek out for a second being in this space and the fashion space too. It wasn't until the 1920s with Coco Chanel that tanning became a thing because she was mm -hmm. captured, I guess she was in the Mediterranean and she was captured um, by a photographer and she had this she got too much sun. I don't think it was intentional, but again, I I don't know the, I just know what I've read. Um, and she got too much sun while on that Mediterranean vacation and a photographer captured it. And that became a beauty standard. So she kind of populated sunbathing and it, it basically showcased a way of life. Like this is your vacation. You come back from your vacation and you have this bronze glow and it means money and opportunity and everything. So it wasn't really until the 1920s that that became a thing, which is super fascinating because that ties into kind of, I guess, their version of pop culture, like 1920s pop culture, I guess. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I, I love this example because you just articulated so many things, right? Like you're talking about body image and beauty standards, but you're also saying this makes you look wealthy. This makes you yeah. look like you can afford a vacation or it looks like you don't need to leave your house in order to have a good life, right? Mm -hmm. That's fascinating to me. It's so interesting because there are so many examples like that, right? And it, it's just fascinating that, you know, even in the 1920s, we were looking toward these basically influencers at the time for beauty standards. I mean, you see it if you see um, there's a couple accounts that create these um, transitions over the decades of like beauty standards and how much changes. So you see like the hair change, the makeup change, like all of that stuff over mm -hmm. time. And it's always because of some kind of like influencer or celebrity or a person kind of dictating that. And it's just it's really interesting to see. And it's also a little concerning to see as well, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, but <laughs> I don't know, fascinating overall. Yeah, celebrity has always been linked to that stuff. I mean, um, I like to give the example of in the during World War II, when when women would draw lines up the back of their legs to look like they were wearing pantyhose, because that was something uh, nylon was something that wasn't really uh, accept not accept uh, uh, available to them at that point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, people have done that kind of stuff for forever. Um, and celebrity always drives, I think always drives beauty standards. I think, I don't know how much we can avoid it <laughs> at this point. I know. 
Yeah, I completely agree. It's such a fascinating conversation. And all right, so what else when it comes to pop culture, beauty standards? Do we want to talk a little bit about Beyonce, Taylor Swift? What do we have kind of going off of that as well? Well, when you're talking about people like Beyonce and Taylor Swift, I tend to think that you're looking at more of the fandom that's created around it. So um, why people are just, you know, so attracted to whatever artist or celebrity Mm -hmm. that they're interested in. Um, What's interesting to me about Beyonce and Taylor Swift is they have curated a fandom that is built on like this acceptance of you just be you and you just do you and who you are. And I, I know that there's a lot of conversation about like what they wear and what their makeup is and how their hair looks and whether or not their outfits look a certain way. Um, and I don't know that that's necessarily as interesting as, you know, what are they doing that are making people be such devout fans to them? Yeah. And I think part of that is they've said, come as you are, be yourself, do what you need to do to be yourself. Um, this is an accepting space and, you know, you can feel free to uh, present yourself in any way that feels comfortable to you. And that's liberating for a lot of people. And, you know, in a lot of ways, take the filter off and, and do all of these things and be the person that you feel comfortable being when you're at a Beyonce concert mm-hmm. or a Taylor Swift concert or filming yourself watching them and putting it on social media. Right. I saw a video of a guy the other day who recreated the Eras tour using like a blanket from his couch as his yes. different ways of wearing her dresses. I saw that. Love <laughs> that's, it. Yeah, that's a, that's amazing, right? Because there's nothing flashy about that. He just did that, mm-hmm. some, whatever he had in his home. So, you know, that's, I think that's probably the draw to people like that is there is this, uh, this um, ability to say, I want to accept you for who you are. I'm going to write songs talking about how we need to accept people for who they are, come to my shows and experience it or watch my videos or whatever, however you're, you're getting that. Yeah, it's super fascinating because you're talking about that in terms of celebrity, but on kind of a brand level too, as I've been building out Little Ultraviolet, kind of those same items and same values and characteristics have been super important to me as I've been building out this brand of like, a lot of people in our community who find us are going through probably one of the worst times in their life. And there's Mm. no need in order to become a part of the community to put on a face, to have a certain air, to Mm. think that you have to feel a certain way. It's very much a come as you are community in terms of like, hey, if things suck right now, guess what? They suck. And there's probably other people in the community who know just how much it sucks. Um, so it's interesting because we're talking about that in celebrity, but that is very much at the center of brand development as well. There are some brands that operate off of not being attainable, right? And Mm -hmm. that's their, their branding. And then other brands that hopefully is what, um, people get when they see Lil Ultraviolet is like, come on, let's go come as you are. Let's have these conversations. Mm -hmm. And this is attainable. You can you can be a part of this community and you don't have to feel a certain way or act a certain way or dress a certain way. Nope. Come on, let's do this. I love that. That's so cool. I'm so glad you're doing that. I hope that that's what, you know, the (laughs) audience listening, hopefully they agree that that's what we're doing. Fingers crossed. But at the end of the day, that's the mission. So hopefully if we aren't there now, we'll be there soon enough. I love that. It, it's so nice to hear that that's the intention you went in with. Like you didn't find it along the way, you just said, nope, this is how we're going to do things. And that's great. I love that that's how you how you set down this path. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate this conversation and your time. And I know people listening, they're going to want to connect with you and geek out about all the things, maybe visit your website, listen to your podcast, follow you on Instagram. Where are the places where they can find you if they want to connect? So my podcast is called Most Popular. And it's I think pretty much everywhere that you can do podcasts and it's starting a second season. It's been on a bit of a hiatus for the last year. So it's starting a second season in February. Um, My website is my name, Adrian Trier hyphen Beanick.com. Do you want me to spell that? I'll put it in the show notes. So no worries. Okay. Okay, good. And then my Instagram is at Dr. Period. So at Dr. Period 
Adrian, T as in Tom, B as in boy. And that's where you can find me for all the things. Perfect. Yeah, I'll put it in the show notes. So it's super easy for people that when they're listening, they can just scroll down, hit those links and hit the follow button. But Adrian, thank you so much again for your time and for this conversation. It's been a great one. Thank you so much. This was so fun.